Welcome to a special edition of Raw Politics and special coverage of two stories dominating tonight. First, the future of UK Prime Minister Theresa May, who tonight will face a vote of confidence by her own party over her handling of Brexit. We're looking at live pictures there from London, uh, Westminster, that's the Greens in front of Westminster. And secondly, the breaking story here in Strasbourg where a massive police search is underway for the man police say is responsible for a deadly shooting and suspected terrorist attack near the famed Christmas market. These are earlier pictures from Strasbourg that you're looking at on your screen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight on Raw Politics. Good to see you with us. Now, we begin in London, where Theresa May will face not only the biggest test yet to her Brexit deal, but also to her leadership. In a little under an hour, Conservative MPs will decide Theresa May's future. Now, the confidence vote will determine whether she will even be around long enough to deliver Britain's exit from the European Union. Our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, is joining us now from Westminster. Darren, what is the latest? It's fast-changing, fast-moving over there. It really has been a dramatic day in British politics. Right this moment, uh, Theresa May is standing up in front of her own Conservative MPs in a last ditch bid to try and convince them that she should essentially stay in the job, uh, Tessa. After what months of speculation, months that we thought a challenge to her leadership was brewing, it finally came today at around 8 a.m. at London time uh, when Sir Graham Brady, who's the chair of the 1922 Select Committee, essentially the governing body of the Conservative Party, announced that he had received received 48 letters, 15% of the Conservative MPs stating that they wanted a challenge to Theresa May's uh, leadership. Throughout the day, uh, there's been lots of speculation about how that vote is going to go uh, tonight. If she loses, uh, she will have to go as Conservative leader. If she wins, uh, well, she will carry on, uh, but be in no doubt that her authority will have been somewhat undermines. Though she was rather defiant uh, when she stood up in Downing Street, what within 30 minutes of that announcement this morning, uh, saying that she is going to carry on doing the job. So there will now be a vote of confidence in my leadership of the Conservative Party. I will contest that vote with everything I've got. A change of leadership in the Conservative Party now will put our country's future at risk and create uncertainty when we can least afford it. A new leader wouldn't be in place by the 21st of January legal deadline, so a leadership election risks handing control of the Brexit negotiations to opposition MPs in Parliament. The new leader wouldn't have time to renegotiate a withdrawal agreement and get the legislation through Parliament by the 29th of March, so one of their first acts would have to be extending or rescinding Article 50, delaying or even stopping Brexit when people want us to get on with it. So how does tonight uh, pan out? Well, as I say, Theresa May is currently addressing those uh, members of the Conservative Party. Voting begins in an hour's time, uh, Tessa. Conservative MPs have got two hours uh, to vote. Uh, it's going to be done the traditional way with the old ballot uh, box. And even though we've had lots of declarations today uh, from Conservative MPs saying that they're going to support uh, Theresa May and in fact, I think at the last count it was over 188. Uh, she needs 159 to stay in the job. It is a secret ballot. So in theory, you could say one thing in public and do something very different in that ballot box. And we're then going to expect the announcement at around 9 p.m., or between 8 and 9 p.m. Uh, local time here in London. So between 9 and 10, uh, where you are in Strasbourg. And Darren, I mean, there's a flurry of activity where you are. You've been speaking to MPs over there. What have they been telling you? Yeah, there's an awful lot of anger, it must be said, among some Conservative MPs. They think that this is a complete distraction uh, from the Brexit negotiations, angry that it is happening at this moment in time when Theresa May has travelled across Europe yesterday to try and build support for her uh, deal. Uh, many feel that it could put Brexit into jeopardy, though there are, of course, Brexiteers who think uh, that this is the moment uh, to try and remove Theresa May because any later uh, and you risk uh, essentially uh, no Brexit at all. Uh, but it must be said tonight, 
the management, when you speak to MPs, it's very much that it looks like Theresa May is going to win uh, this uh, vote, uh, that she is going to get a majority of Conservative MPs. Uh, many suggesting that yet again uh, Brexiteers, uh, the uh, ERG as they're called, have really misunderstood uh, the level of support that they may well uh, have. Let's speak to someone though who knows uh, Theresa May. He's a, a former advisor to the Prime Minister, uh, works for uh, LBC radio station here in London. Uh, Tom, as you can hear, there's an awful lot of uh, loud supporters uh, and Brexiteers and Remainers here. Uh, you know Theresa May. First of all, what did you think of her tone today and how do you think she will be personally dealing with, uh, with this vote tonight? Um, well, it was defiant, that tone on the steps of Downing Street. Uh, it reflected what she said when she first came into office about the challenge that she, she wanted to address as Prime Minister. Um, she won't resign. I mean, she is not a quitter. Uh, she won't go anywhere until she's forced out, I think. Um, that may happen tonight, but frankly, this is a very loud, uh, very cold sideshow. This doesn't solve anything. Um, whether people get rid of her or not, the central question is, how, what Brexit looks like and at the moment there's no majority for that. So, so what, why do you think now, why have these 48 MPs or, or potentially more come forward to try and provoke this leadership challenge? Well it's been building because we saw over the last few weeks the, the calls coming in to send in the letters and it didn't happen the first time round. Clearly when she went to Europe and, and came back with a deal that satisfied nobody and then pulled it, people were st seriously angry about that. Um, so it was, it was always coming and it sort of always has to happen really this. It has to happen. We have to have a, the question answered about the future of the Prime Minister but her future is connected to the deal I think and it's an interesting position to be in for some MPs who will vote to back the Prime Minister tonight but won't vote for the deal if and when it's brought back. And so what happens next if we work on the <laughs> assumption uh, we, should pro we should make yeah. uh, predictions possibly in this situation but let's assume she wins. Uh, what, what does then happen next? She is somewhat weakened by this and the fundamentals of trying to get the deal, her withdrawal agreement through Parliament, haven't really changed. No, I agree. Um, I think it, it, depending on the scale of the, the vote against her, um, if she wins by one, she will carry on, but it will, will undermine her authority, although her authority is already severely undermined as it is. Um, if, if Europe are able to come back with something that placates Brexiteers on her own side about the Irish backstop, if, if the EU is able to uh, open up again parts of the withdrawal agreements, a big if, if she's able to get it through Parliament, this will all go away and be fine and, and Brexit will carry on um, on the 29th of March 2019. If she can't, we're still stuck in the same position. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, just very quickly, yes or no, do you think she's going to win tonight? Yes. Cool. Tom, thank you very much. It's Tom Swarbrick, uh, their former uh, aide uh, to the Prime Minister. I say, in a rather defiant mood uh, this evening, Theresa May, as she addresses uh, those uh, MPs. It must be said, though, there are two caveats to all of this. A sign that Downing Street are nervous about this vote. One is that the Prime Minister is expected to tell those MPs that essentially she is not going to stand or be their candidate at the next election, uh, that she will potentially go some point in the next year. Uh, of course, many MPs were concerned about her leading them into the next election. And also, Tessa, two MPs who had essentially had their membership of the Conservative Party suspended, well, they've been reinstated uh, tonight. Only two MPs, but a sign, I think, of how Downing Street are concerned about the vote. But as I say, the expectation in Westminster is uh, that she will uh, manage to get enough MPs on board and that she will remain as leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister of the UK. All right, thank you for that, uh, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor, and joining me in the studio to dive into what is happening in Westminster tonight. We have uh, British MEP and former UKIP leader Nigel Farage joining us in the studio. We also have Jacqueline Foster. She's a deputy leader of the Conservative, British Conservative MEPs here at the European Parliament. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. All right. Jacqueline, you were nodding when, when it was being mentioned uh, uh, by Darren and his guests there that this is a distraction. You were nodding vigorously. Why do you think this is a distraction? It's a distraction because people like me want to get on with leaving the European Union on the 29th of March. Um, it was always going to be difficult. Uh, what I do know is clearly on both sides of the party there are those who really very much wanted to remain. Um, there seemed to be an awful lot of money spent by lawyers trying to stall this process with some of them. And then, of course, as mentioned on the other side, we have Brexiteers, fellow Brexiteers, and I don't 
I don't think whatever deal she came up with, again, that they'll be satisfied. We're also in a position where the entire Labour Party is being whipped in to oppose any deal that she comes up with, along with the SNP and others. So you're happy with this deal? So um, I am. I am satisfied with the deal. But where I am frustrated is that today she was supposed to meet the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland. She spent time yesterday with other leaders because clearly there are some concerns in terms of some of the detail, I think, and confidence with regards to the situation of Northern Ireland when we leave. And I am originally from Northern Ireland, my family. Right. So, of course, I think we have a real interest in that. And I think there are some colleagues who do need a little bit more clarity and reassurance. Nigel, the, you know, the, the future of Theresa May and future of the Brexit deal, do you think those two are intertwined and cannot be separated? Not today. <laughs> it's, it's a very ironic position. Look, I love to be a contrarian. I love to predict surprises. She's going to win comfortably. That's pretty clear. You know, a third of the Parliamentary Conservative Party are on the payroll, and Turkey is very rarely vote for Christmas. And most backbench Tory MPs aren't particularly principled or ideological on Europe. They just want to keep their jobs. So she's going to win this. My guess is 200, 100. I mean, something of that order. So she stays on as Prime Minister, and yet, and here's the irony, her deal is no closer to succeeding. And the fact that yesterday she was in The Hague, Berlin, Brussels, she's back tomorrow for the summit. The fact is, uh, when this lot here say they're not changing the withdrawal agreement, they mean it. I expect tomorrow night she'll come back with a codicil, a form of words, uh, you know, giving a bit of general encouragement, but legally nothing will change. So no, she stays as Prime Minister, but the deal is no nearer to passing, which is a very strange place. So wh what is the worst case scenario for you in this case? Well, I think what happens here is we run out of time, basically. You know, we hit that, that deadline of the 21st of January, albeit that could slip as many other things have. Uh, my view, and this is not what I want, I want us just to leave, but, but my view is we will face at some point in late January a choice, which is leave on WCO terms and get on with our lives, or we face the horrendous prospect of coming here and asking for Article 50 to be extended. And I think at the moment there's such gridlock in Parliament, there's almost not a majority for anything in Parliament, and I feel we're headed down a road where Brexit gets delayed. I mean, you also want to leave. You, you're also Absolutely. Brexit too, but do, I mean, do you agree with Nigel in, in um, this sense? Not necessarily on that process, um, because I don't believe it's in anybody's interest to start delaying or playing around now with Article 50. I think what we need to do is get behind the Prime Minister, because I want a Brexit. Uh, there isn't another game in town. And for people that sit there thinking the simplistic world of running on WTO is the answer, they are wrong too. I live in an area which is high-tech, high-end manufacturing. We are world leaders in some of these areas, as well as the automotive industry and uh, the aerospace sector and all this. This is what Britain leads in. And we are cross-border manufacturers. And our, our businesses and industry and people that work in them need some certainty. And this procrastination and this playing around and petty politics and vendettas and me, 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 15 minutes of fame, as what Andy Warhol said. Mm. I am absolutely sick and tired of it too. And so are the British public. We need to get on with this process and we need to leave on the 29th of but March. But the backstop is not petty. The backstop actually is very, very fundamental. Do you know, even I, as an avowed Brexiteer, could have accepted this deal. Wouldn't have been perfect. I could have accepted it if I thought we're leaving and there's a chance to move on. The problem with this deal and the problem with her accepting the principle of a backstop is that legally we can never leave this unless the other side allows us to. Now that is not something, that is not something that any free country would ever willingly go into. And, 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 and Jackie, you're going to have to face this. If this deal cannot get a majority in Parliament, and that looks pretty likely at the moment, you know, that is the choice we face. Basically, it's WTO or it's suspending Article 50. Well, I have a different view on the backstop. The backstop is an insurance policy, and it's not in the EU's interest to actually go into the backstop. If it is that we got to a position and the EU started to play games in terms of being in the backstop, it would restrict the Euro European Union from, again, negotiating third country trade deals if they have 27 members and then a sort of UK that's neither one thing nor but the we other. Can't so leave it is it. not. But we can't leave. It, it. is a joint decision. We 
can't it leave it. It will be a joint decision. It will in not be a free will, will be decision of the British people. If there is a dispute about anything, there will be an <laughs> independent body that will deal with that, and that is not an EU body, Nigel. I don't think yeah, you understand and we'll be, that. And we'll be outnumbered three well, two. Well, I don't believe we'll that you are correct. We'll be outnumbered three two. No, no, of course I'm correct. I'm afraid that we'll have to agree to disagree no, 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 on it. No, no, it's legally absolutely clear. No, I don't that agree we, with you. Your own Attorney General said in the Houses of Parliament, we cannot unilaterally withdraw from this. And that is the problem. That is the problem. And that is why I don't think this will get a parliamentary majority. We'll see. Well, I mean, where this is going, I mean, two Brexiteers having completely different ideas of what Brexit means. I mean, this, it doesn't bode well for, for those who are, you know, Brexiteers. Well, I mean, way. look, 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 the Prime Minister has made a, a, a cataclysmic political mistake. You know, she left Downing Street at 4.15 in the morning on the 8th of December mm. 2017 to meet a deadline set by an unelected European bureaucrat called Barnier. She signed right. up to something called the backstop and we've been in trouble ever since then. Okay, let's get, let's get the view of some of the MEPs here. Our colleague uh, Shona Murray, a correspondent, has been talking to MEPs and to see what they think of what is going on in the UK. Shona. Yeah, Tessa, I'm joined here by Sophie Interfeld, one of the most prominent voices, of course, on Brexit around these parts. Sophie. What's your assessment, first of all, at what's taking place before our eyes in the UK? <laughs> well, it, it's just very difficult to say. I was thinking of the right terms to describe you know, how I feel, and the term is probably flabbergasted. Uh, I mean, it is so chaotic by now, um, and there doesn't seem to be any sense of responsibility in any of the political parties, uh, and, and, and the recognition that if you know at some point you will have to compromise and um, and and accept the deal that's on the table mm -hmm. and there will not be any other deals uh, we've been working uh, on an agreement for two years uh, this is pretty much it uh, and I would say this is a really bad time for a leadership's contest this would be a really good time for unity and responsibility but at the same time if this deal doesn't pass, nobody wants a no-deal scenario. So could the EU do something to save Theresa May at this point? No, uh, because, look, we've gone through a wide range of options. and But the point has never been that there couldn't be any agreement between the EU and the UK. The point has always been that there's no agreement within the UK because whatever option we choose, there will not be a majority. That's the whole problem. The problem is, and it has been all along, it has been for years, for decades, as a matter of fact, disunity within the Tory party, uh, between, also within the Labour party, between the parties. That is the real problem. And we cannot fix that problem. Uh, Nigel Farage uh, said that Theresa May made a cataclysmic mistake. Uh, I suppose she, she's he was talking about last December. But what's your assessment of how this has been managed over the past couple of years, coming to this conclusion, which was actually hailed as, you know, something satisfactory, this deal. Well, it's very interesting that she's being so heavily criticised. Now, look, I'm, I don't belong to her party. I'm not a fan of Mrs May. Uh, but I would like to see anybody making a better proposal and negotiating a better deal. Because what, the, what many British politicians don't seem to understand is that this is not a kind of you know, regular give and take and meeting in the middle kind of negotiations. This is, this is the UK leaving the EU. And that means that the EU will stay intact. We are not going to change the rules of the EU in order to better suit some of the Tory members. And indeed, I mean, if there were, if it were true that she's made a very bad deal and there was a very obvious better deal, then somebody would have put that forward, wouldn't they? The point is that the Brits cannot choose between, uh, you know, hard Brexit, soft Brexit, uh, pretty Brexit, ugly Brexit or no Brexit. Or, or a no-deal Brexit, uh, and they need to make up their mind. So it's a case of standby. Sophie Interveld there, Dutch MEP and member of the Aldi Group. Back to you, Tessa. All right, thank you for that, uh, Shona and uh, Sophie Interveld. All right, well, that confidence vote we're talking about, it will take place later this evening, but the process is a complicated one. Let's take a look at just how it could unfold. Forty-eight letters are needed to trigger a vote of no confidence in a Conservative Party leader. That's 15% of Tory MPs. These letters are sent anonymously to a group called the 1922 Committee. The group's made up of backbench Tory MPs and chaired by Sir Graham Brady, who remains silent until the required number has been reached. Once there, MPs are summoned to vote in a secret ballot. 158 votes or 50% is needed for Theresa May to win the challenge. If she succeeds, she's safe from another leadership challenge for a year. 
If she loses, there will be a contest for her successor and she won't be able to stand. Contenders who throw their name into the hat will then be whittled down to two through a series of rounds, with one person eliminated in each. Party members vote for the winner who will then become Prime Minister. But the process could take weeks and risk splitting the party. I mean, I think we can all agree that early indications show that she will survive the, the vote of uh, confidence tonight. Um, a, a snap YouGov poll also showed that the British people would like her to stay. All right. Is, was this a massive miscalculation on, on the opposition? This could backfire on them. I'd start with you, Jacqueline. In terms of opposition, do you mean the Labour Party? To challenging, yeah. To, yeah to, well, to I mean... Theresa May. The Labour Party. The Labour Party haven't even got an alternative. The Labour Party are whipping in their MPs, as I said earlier, um, to disagree with anything that she comes up with. In fact, nobody has come up with a better solution than she's come up with in terms of the withdrawal agreement. Quite frankly, and so um, yeah, I just think it. What does it play into? And, and, and what about for the, the Tories themselves? From the, the Conservative Tories, point yeah, yeah, of view, as I said, I think at my opening remarks, this is just wasting precious time. Mm. Uh, we have a deadline, we have a time frame, and we need certainty, and we need to start moving on to the future. So who, whoever has ambitions in the Conservative Party has just missed there are a variety. <laughs> there are a variety of people. Um, I cannot name anyone, quite frankly, who could have actually done a better job in trying to negotiate <laughs> this withdrawal agreement, quite well, frankly. Well, anybody and even in you, Nigel. Anybody as an entrepreneur, anybody who ever worked in business. By the way, I coined the phrase 10 days before the referendum, no deal is better than a bad deal. Oh, and right. I put that out there in the last two weeks. The point about it is, when you're in business, you go and see somebody, they know, particularly if you're their biggest client, which we are, we buy BMWs and 20 million bottles of champagne every year and all the rest of it. If they know you're serious, that you, that you will simply walk away, uh, then you've got the basis on which to negotiate. The problem here is we agreed to the wrong sequencing from the very beginning. I mean, to anybody that's ever worked in business, the concept you pay away a minimum of £40 billion in return for some vague promises, that is not how you do business. And I'm, I tell you what frustrates me, and we've both been here a long, long time. I can remember going way back to 2001, Neil Kinnock saying to me, if you want to leave the EU and have a free trade deal, we'll do it. Just guard stand, saying the same thing to me. Donald Tusk on March the 7th last year, saying the same thing. We could have gone for a simple free trade agreement. The problem was the Prime Minister actually wanted to keep us closely linked to the institutions of the European Union. We have mishandled this from the start. And the reason you've got people who tonight will lose well, is they felt on principle they had to do something. Do you not recognise that you're going to lose, you're also going to lose a lot of access to, to your, I mean, that's, that's essentially the, the businesses are I, afraid. I mean, if I, if I may come in okay. here, I mean, I've worked in business. I mean, not all of us have been professional politicians. I've worked in business and industry as well for more than half of my life before coming, becoming a politician. So please don't presume, Nigel and others, that there are people who are I MEPs entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs or, 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 with their own money or MPs. running businesses. Fine. There and how do you know that we don't have families that do all these things? You don't know that. But it's, it's, it's the comments that come from Nigel, I'm afraid, and others, that it's so simplistic, it's so easy, and it was never going to be easy. We've been members of a club for nearly 45 years. Our business industry and a lot of our lives is intrinsically entrenched in these institutions in which we people had voted to join what was a common market and then literally obviously and became the EU. To leave them. We're and we have we want to leave them. I don't need a let I, I know what we voted we for. Want to leave. But we need a proper deal. We need the deal that gives us the certainty and the space and the time because it's not you that's going to be responsible for employing six thousand people people in a business somewhere because oh, you don't right. have any responsibility. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm the same. I'm not employing people, but it is our job. It is our job to deliver right. our and make sure It's our job okay. to, to deliver the referendum. We, it is our job to deliver and that. this is the dishonesty, and in the isn't it? in the same process, make sure we've got some certainty and stability for the economy and the people that live in the United States. We voted, right. to, last, we last voted to leave the customs union, the single market, the European Union. We did it once in a, in, a, in, a, in a referendum. We did it again in a general election. Those people are being betrayed. And the common and agricultural I, right. and I think policy. The Tory party, and the common fisheries the policy. The, uh, That's what we will leave. And none of it's happening. We will and leave. And the Tory party is about to split. 
on this, I think. Yeah. I mean, this is always the crux of the matter of the debate, so even, even among Brexiteers themselves. All right, we'll leave it at that for now. Coming up on Raw Politics for you, we take you to the heart of the UK leadership crisis. We're live at Downing Street and Westminster for the latest on Theresa May's battle for survival. Plus, it has been less than 24 hours since a gunman targeted the city centre here in Strasbourg. We are joined by MEPs who share their stories on what they witnessed as the tragedy unfolded. Do stay with us. There will now be a vote of confidence in my leadership of the Conservative Party. I will contest that vote with everything I've got. Well, after her statement in the morning, Theresa May's day did not get any easier. She headed to the Commons for her weekly question and answer appointment with MPs. Opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn has long been criticised for avoiding Brexit during these sessions. But today, he couldn't avoid it. Take a look. Can she now confirm that we will have the concluding days of debates and votes within the next seven days yeah. before the House rises for the Christmas recess? I'll tell members on the other side when we've had a meaningful vote. We had it in the referendum on 2016. And, it's, and, if, he, and if he wants a meaningful date, I'll give him one. 29th of March 2019, when we leave the European Union. Jeremy Corbyn! Totally and absolutely unacceptable to this House in any way. This House, this House agreed a programme motion. This House agreed the five days of debate. This House agreed when the vote was going to take place. The Government tried to unilaterally pull that and deny this House, deny this House the chance of a vote on this crucial matter. The Prime Minister and her government have already been found to be in contempt of Parliament. Her behaviour today is just contemptuous of this Parliament and of this well, now, as Theresa May's fate hangs in the balance, let's look at what could happen after the vote comes in, the results come in tonight. And for analysis on this, I'm joined by our London correspondent, Vincent McAvinney. Vincent, all right, there are indications that she could survive this. Let's, let, let's go through the scenarios. What happens if she does survive? Good evening, Tessa from a chilly Downing Street. Well, just to bring you up to date with the latest, Theresa May isn't here. She's stayed in the House of Commons after PMQs to try to lobby support. And she actually started a little while ago addressing her MPs at a private meeting, trying to confirm that those numbers that we're hearing that she's got in support, around, we think, 150 or so declared supporters are actually accurate because it is a secret ballot tonight. Some of those who've publicly declared may not actually do so when they get to the vote. She needs 159 to win and she's going to be telling those MPs that she's not going to go on indefinitely. This is not a vote to back her at the next general election in 2022. This is just for her to deliver Brexit and then we will see what happens. So those MPs will be going in. There'll be one metal box in committee room 14. There's two boxes on the ballot. They have confidence in Theresa May or they do not have confidence in Theresa May. After two hours of voting, the head of the 1922 committee um, will be counting up those ballots with three other members and then he will declare around nine o'clock local time, ten o'clock Central European time and we then expect the Prime Minister, whatever happens, to come outside of here and make an address outside the door to number ten. So if she is successful, she will carry on in the job. This means that she has a year's grace where this whole process can't be done again and she will carry on by going to the EU Council meeting tomorrow in Brussels. And on the other hand, if she doesn't make it, if she loses, what, what then? Well, if the Prime Minister does lose tonight, then she will effectively become a caretaker Prime Minister. It will not mean that she has to move out of Downing Street tomorrow. There won't be any moving vans here. She will simply stay in post, much like David Cameron did after he resigned the day after the Brexit referendum, whilst the leadership contest goes on. And we'll then see the runners and riders coming forward. And at the beginning, it might be a bit like the Grand National Horse Race. Lots of people running, bumping into each other, and then through various rounds, the herd 
word gets thinned down. So the names to watch out for, the Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt, the Home Secretary Sajid Javid, they are two prominent members of the Cabinet who are likely to be running. And then on the Brexiteer side, it is likely they will try to unify if they can. They're quite a fractious bunch behind one candidate. Again, that is likely to be the former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson. He uh, will be the one that they want to replace the Prime Minister. And I think if he does win in that leadership race, then he will be uh, on course to change many of the faces currently in the government. He will be invited by the uh, Queen once the Theresa May has resigned at the end of that caretaking period to form a new government. And he will bring a lot of different people in here. And then it'll ultimately be for the new Prime Minister, whoever that is, either Boris Johnson on the uh, Brexiteer side or someone on the Remain side to decide whether they need to pause Article 50 in order to have more time to possibly go back to Brussels to try to get more concessions, maybe a better deal, or if they're going to stick with the course and either take the deal that May has got to Parliament, maybe with a bit of tweaking, or if they want to head to a no-deal scenario on the 29th of March 2019. There is really no way of predicting what exactly will happen. It is definitely uh, an unpredictable uh, sort of week, few weeks coming up if Theresa May May does lose. All right, thank you for that, Vincent McAvenny, live there in London. And joining me in the studio tonight is Seb Das, a British Labour MEP who sits with the Socialists and Democrats here at the European Parliament, and Leah Niryada, an Irish Sinn Féin MEP who sits with the GUE NGL in the European Parliament as well. All right, Seb, you've been shaking your head <laughs> the whole time listening to that. Which part of that did you oh. disagree with? No, I didn't disagree at all with, with, with the analysis, uh, only so far as to say I, I, I don't think no deal in the event that she loses, and I don't think she will, by the way, uh, no deal in in the event that she loses, I'm sorry, will not happen because there is no majority in the House of Commons to support a Prime Minister uh, with, a, with, with the intention of, of taking the UK out of the European Union without a deal. So that categorically will not happen. Um, I think she will survive. Um, she'll be wounded by this. But I also think that the ERG, which is the, uh, the hardcore Brexiters in the Tory party, I think they've, they've completely shot their fox on this one. The timing is extraordinary. They simply don't have the numbers they need. And I think what will be revealed tonight is that there is no support for no deal in the British Parliament. And I think that should give all of us uh, a lot of comfort. Yeah, and, and you know, the Irish back backstop being, being the biggest issue here and not having a hard border, does this, in her, her in the indications that she's going to survive this, does, does that give you a sense of comfort uh, in the sense that perhaps the Irish backstop that's currently in the deal will stay? Well, there's nothing about it really that's providing comfort because, look, you have two choices. You either have a deal or no deal, irrespective of whether it's Theresa May or somebody else. At bottom line, it comes down to that. And the, I suppose, decision day is looming nearer and nearer. And for us, of course, it's about protecting the Good Friday Agreement. It's about upholding that in all of its parts. It's about ensuring rights for citizens right across the north. And it's about, of course, never returning to a hard border. So they're the key things for us to ensure that that is in place. Um, I find that the whole no confidence vote in Theresa May this evening, I wonder, is it some kind of distraction? As you were saying, the tactics, the timing of it is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Given that she delayed and postponed the vote that was to take place in Parliament, given that the deadline for a decision is coming up really soon, and then in the middle of it you have this chaos. So what it indicates to me certainly is that the British government seems to be in absolute chaos, completely divided, and it seems to be imploding. And it's stumbling from one car crash to another. Remember, this time last year we thought we had the bones of a deal in place, mm. and they reneged on that. And what's to say that they're not going to renege on this? But now the time has come where they can no longer renege, and it's literally deal or no deal. Go ahead. I think there's a third option. Well, of course <laughs> there is a third option, but... which is no Brexit. <laughs> no and Brexit, actually, yeah. what, what we heard today from Amber Rudd uh, was interesting when she mm. was being interviewed. She said, look, there is only one Brexit on offer. Mm. It is this 585-page document, and nobody mm. likes it. Nobody likes it except... You don't some... believe it is the best possible deal that she can get? No, it's the only deal she oh, can right. get. I mean, this is what Brexit is. So we've had two years of, oh, it's going to be more trade, it's going to be this, that and the other. The reality is it's 585 uh, uh, page document and it's painful. It's painful because, of course, in order to get everything economically that the UK mm -hmm. needs, it has to cede control to uh, a set of institutions that it is leaving and will no longer have any say over. That is Brexit. And I think that when you see the Brexiters who pushed the idea of Brexit to the British people disowning this document, you see Remainers obviously disowning this document because we're saying, I'm sorry, this is not in the 
the nation's interest, and the only people supporting it are some very unconvincing cabinet ministers. And I think, given tonight that no deal, I think, will be removed from the equation, you therefore have a choice. This 585-page document or no Brexit. Do and you I think, think that is realistic? Yes, absolutely. I think the spectre of no Brexit will increase massively now. Leah, do you agree with that, that it's possible that there's no Brexit? Well, look, I think it's wishful thinking and it's aspirational and it's something obviously we'd all be delighted with if there was no Brexit. And we know from the ECJ ruling, for instance, that they can uh, revoke Article 50. Uh, but then they can, you know, put it in, put it out, and, and this ridiculous kind of merry dance could go on as well. And I don't think on a practical level that will happen. Um, but again, for us, look, a, a, a no Brexit is the ideal, obviously, because we don't want to have Brexit. 56% of the people in the mm. North mm. voted to remain. Mm. Uh, their democratic wishes need to be respected, mm -hmm. which they're not. Mm -hmm. And I suppose we're in that unique position that we have one step in Europe and one step part of another country that doesn't want to be in Europe. So we're the back door in that regard. And it's really, really um, impinging and encroaching on us economically. It's encroaching on our citizens' mm. rights, on freedom of movement, mm. all of that. Mm. It is a disaster. Mm. So really right. for us, it's about perhaps looking at the reunification of Ireland now. And now is the time to start talking about well, that I'll, in I'll, the event. I'll give you the last word. Really yeah, quickly. sure. No, just just, just on, 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 when you say it's wishful thinking, of course, the, the only way that mm. Brexit can happen is for the deal to pass. Mm -hmm. And the deal has no support in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. So, in my view, I cannot see how the Prime Minister gets this 585-page document through the House of Commons. So, this begs all sorts of questions. I'm not sure it's as wishful thinking as people mm. perhaps think at this point. Mm. All right, a lot of ideas on the table there. Is it wishful thinking or not? So, coming up here on Raw Politics after the break, we get the latest on that investigation into a deadly shooting in Strasbourg last night, and we talk to an MEP who witnessed the attack. Don't go away. We are in a restaurant at the moment. Uh, you can see the windows have been have been closed. The shutters have been uh, uh, put to down as well in front of the restaurant. I saw a couple of police officers in front of the door. The restaurant owners have been informed to not let any of the patrons out of the restaurant. All right, as you saw there, just like hundreds of others here in Strasbourg, we found ourselves caught up in a breaking story last night, one that is still underway. France has increased its ter terror alert to its highest level, and hundreds of police officers are looking for a 29-year-old man they say is responsible for a deadly shooting near the famed Christmas market. That search includes a nearby border with Germany, where agents checked vehicles and trams crossing into the country. Investigators say that two people were killed and a third person is brain dead after a man opened fire. Twelve were injured, six of them seriously. And this is what investigators had to say. Je peux toutefois vous informer que quatre proches du mis en, en, en cause ont été placés en garde à vue cette nuit. Ces gardes à vue sont donc toujours en cours. Sur le profil de l'intéressé, Sheriff C est né le 24 février 1989 à Strasbourg. Il est très connu des services de police et de justice pour des faits de droit commun, principalement pour des faits de vol et de violence. All right, well, we are now getting a better sense of exactly how the attack unfolded last night. Alex Morgan in the Cube joins us now to break down that part of the story. Alex. Well, Tessa, this happened really right in the heart of Strasbourg. Strasbourg, of course, a city in the uh, the south, uh, sorry, into the east of France. You're mentioning there it's very close uh, relationship with the border with Germany. But this here, right in the centre of the city, where there was this large Christmas market going on, thousands of tourists, of course, politicians in town as well. Well, the public, uh, the. Paris public prosecutor breaking down today the events as they unfolded. Obviously, we covered this in real time last night, and we put a timeline together today at looking back on the events of last night. And it started at just before 8 o'clock Central European time when the attacker was seen here. This is, uh, if I bring up that image of that door, uh, 10 uh, Rue de, de Orfer here. It is here. He was pictured, uh, he was seen with a weapon. And it is from here uh, that this attack uh, unfolded. From there, he moved from that street onto uh, Rue des Grandes Arcades down here. Now, this is a major shopping street. It is on the periphery of the Christmas market, of course, full of people at this uh, time of the year. Now, 
Uh, one of those uh, many people there was filming from an above balcony looking down on the street and a video uh, which we've had to cut so we cannot show you all of this shows you the screaming and the panic in the immediate aftermath. The reason we can't show you the whole thing is there is a body of somebody in the street here. But this is a video taken during uh, the uh, attack itself. So you can see very distressing scenes. You hear a lot of people screaming, a lot of people uh, shouting there as well. So very much uh, a case of the attacker went uh, area by area, neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street here, attacking people with both a pistol and a knife. We know he was confronted by soldiers. We don't know exactly where, but that he, he was uh, wounded during uh, those confrontations. Now, we spoke to uh, Axel here. He was one of many people posting on social media about his experience of being caught up. He's 25. He is from Strasbourg. Emmanuel and our team here in the Cube speaking to him. He's very much shaken up by this. He and his girlfriend were visiting the Christmas market. They were in the square nearby. His girlfriend had kept them there a bit longer to look at the Christmas tree. And he thinks that saved their lives because then they moved on to that street I just showed you, Rue de Grand Arcade, heard three gunshots and then saw a man with uh, that handgun. He says he then saw a group of women running towards him, shouting, they're shooting, run, and he then ran with his girlfriend away. But he believes that decision to linger by the Christmas tree uh, saved his life. It put them uh, a distance away from the direct path. I might just uh, then say the attacker went on to uh, an area called uh, Rue uh, saint Alain here, and let me just bring you up a scene from the streets afterwards. One of the victims here being attended to. We spoke to the person who took this image saying, after the attack, there was this rush to help the people there, the streets eerily calm. But overall, we can see a path uh, traced by the attacker through the city from that 10, that number door, uh, door I showed you at the beginning, right the way through the center of the city before he took a cab here at this bridge southwards. The search is still on for where he is now, Tessa. All right, thank you for that, uh, Alex Morgan and the team in the Cube. Apologies there for the uh, slight sound issues. All right, joining me in the studio tonight is an MEP who was there at the Christmas market last night, Georges uh, Christos. Georges is a Greek MEP from the New Democracy in the EPP group, and also Sean Kelly, an Irish MEP from Fine Gael, also in the EPP group, and who spoke in yesterday's debate on counter-terrorism measures ahead of the uh, shooting. All right, Georges, I'll start with you. You know, what was your experience last night? Where were you and what did you see? Well, I was uh, near Place Kleber, near the big Christmas tree, and then I, I didn't see a lot. I heard the gunshots, and I saw people running uh, to save themselves. So I joined uh, uh, those running, and I had to run for my life for three, or three to four hundred meters, uh, and then ask instructions from uh, the policemen that were near nearby, uh, but um, uh, the perpetrator started shooting at one point and then so, so we heard the gunshots and went at uh, smaller streets. Then he, start, he continued shooting from another point, so we made the calculation that he was uh, on our back and then we had to uh, try another direction. Uh, it was scary, but not too scary for us. They didn't see the bodies, the blood, the, the people that were actually killed. Yes, yeah, so scary. What else were you feeling? What was going through your mind as this was unfolding? Well, uh, it wasn't the time for uh, analyzing the situation. Uh, I had the impression that the Strasbourg was safe because I know that the police measures are adequate uh, and you can observe the policemen trying to protect you. So they are doing their best. But there is not uh, a case of 100% safety in big towns. Uh, I was in Brussels when the, in, near the metro station because it was in, in, in my neighborhood when the bomb exploded after the explosion in the airport. Uh, and I have visited Nice or London uh, several... Do, do you think that people now suddenly think that, you know, this could happen, that it's in the back of their head? Yes, of these course. These kinds of attacks this could is, happen. Uh, this is the peculiarity with... Uh, uh, let's say terrorism. Uh, statistically speaking, it is insignificant because I'm really interested and I have read the statistics. Right. It's more probable that you will uh, die in a car crash or in a, in a okay. aircraft well, accident. You know, last, but yeah. it, it, uh, it, uh, it has a great impact on their psychology and their political behavior. And last night here at the European Parliament, actually, they held a, held a minute of silence for the victims of that attack. It wasn't long before things got heated and it turned political. Let's take a look. Non si può consentire davvero che gli errori di una Francia e spesso anche di un'Europa arrivino 
a spalleggiare una, un'azione di un, estremismo, di un estremismo islamico, di un estremismo islamico che spesso, ripeto, toglie in modo ingiusto la vita a dei cittadini. Io mi associo alla protesta e vi dico svegliatevi, svegliatevi! Mi faccia parlare come io ho fatto parlare lei, si sieda immediatamente, si sieda immediatamente. Tel, tel dei charognards, vous vous jetez sur le dépouille des victimes, même pas refroidi, pour en faire un acte politique. Honte à vous, honte à vous! All right, Sean, I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the timing clearly was, was uh, inappropriate, especially at the time that happened last night. But is there a political point to be made here? I'm not sure there's a political point. I think we have to stand back and look at it. And in fairness, uh, I was in the parliament last night when that happened. And I think it was probably people who were upset and excited. And it got a small bit uh, r- noisy, which was unfair, I think, to President Tiani, who was doing his best to organize uh, a normal leaving for us post 2 a.m. in the morning. So from the point of view of the political aspects, yes, there is in the sense that uh, the report which Ironically, we discussed the terrorism report yesterday in Parliament and voted on today and then we did the terrorist attack last night. How ironic could it be? But definitely, I think it shows that we have to mobilize people, make them alert, help them uh, to be resilient. And we can do that in a political manner by creating platforms, etc., online, which you recommended, to help people to be aware and, above all, to try and remove... Uh, any information or any uh, thing that goes up on the internet advocating terrorism of any I mean, that kind. That timing is clearly, what, it was very eerie, you know, after discussing that and then the attack happened last night. All right, do stay with us uh, on World Politics because after the break, we'll have more for you on Brexit. Can Theresa May fend off a leadership challenge? We take you to Downing Street and Westminster Live ahead of that crucial vote. Don't go away. All right, welcome back. Uh, UK Prime Minister Theresa May is in Brussels tonight and sitting down with the Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, desperate to win any kind of concession for her hard-fought Brexit deal. And that's where our political uh, editor, Darren McCaffrey, is tonight. Darren, uh, what can we you know, expect from her? She's uh, expected to be speaking as well. What do we, what do we expect to hear from her? Uh, well, as you say, Tessa, she's uh, been in Brussels for about an hour and a half or so. She spent that time in there in the EU Council building talking to uh, Donald Tusk. Within the last uh, minute or so, I've just spotted a motorcade uh, coming into this building, uh, to the Berlamont, to the European Commission uh, building, where uh, she is going to now have a conversation with Jean-Claude uh, Juncker. Uh, though we have just heard from Theresa May, also in the last few minutes, speaking uh, to the British uh, press, in which she says that there is no deal without the backstop in it, which is evidently uh, clear from all the words that we've heard from uh, European lead- Union leaders uh, today. Uh, but she does say there could be assurances about how Britain could use it. Uh, but she has, as I say, ruled out removing uh, the, the, the backstop at all from the withdrawal agreement. Now, why is that still difficult for her? Why might those assurances, uh, if they even are legally binding, not enough? Is because for many MPs, including Brexiteers like Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, removing essentially the backstop as it is, that is that Britain could leave it unilaterally and that it has got a time limit on it, uh, is just not on the cards. It's a red line for them and they will vote against her deal if that does not happen. And she is conceding tonight that essentially that is not possible. So where do we go to uh, next? Well, she's going to go back to London uh, tomorrow to have Prime Minister's question time. That'll be difficult. She's then meeting the Irish Prime Minister. And then she's going to come back to Brussels on Thursday for another EU Council summit. But be in no doubt, these are really difficult times. And there's a change in the mood at Westminster where many people thought that the Prime Minister was persevering with these talks to try and get a better deal. But many of those MPs are now starting to change their mind that essentially she's just buying time, potentially for her own political career, and that there may be a move against her as leader of the Conservative Party. Much speculation tonight that those fable 48 letters may have got to uh, that number that would force a leadership challenge. Uh, She said in the last few minutes she hasn't heard any word that it has reached 48, but it is entirely possible that may well change in the next 24 hours or so.
All right, thank you for that update, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor. And back with me to discuss this is Eva Kaili, a Greek socialist MEP with the SND Group, and Jan Zaradil, a Czech MEP with the Civic Democratic Party, sitting with the ECR Group. Right, I think what I want to know now is perspective uh, from you as a, as a Czech MEP. How is this being viewed from the East, from, from your, your part of Europe? Well, of course, we, first of all, we regret uh, UK leaving the EU. Uh, second, we respect that, however, and sadly we would like to have a deal, last but not least, because uh, Central and Eastern Europeans are very frequent residents and workers in the United Kingdom and they have to have some uh, legal guarantees and in that deal uh, there are, I would say, sufficient legal guarantees of their social and welfare status. So definitely it's better for us to have a deal, but I think that we have to prepare ourselves that just us, Central Eastern Europe, but the entire European Union for the situation that so there would for, be for no Central deal. For Central Eastern Europeans, there's a lot to worry about the workers that are uh, that yeah, are working. Yeah. The what about for for the Greeks in Southern Europe? What is also for Greece worried? the same? But I would say that this is really strange. I think she's trying to gain some time. It's loud and clear that this is the deal, or there is no deal. So basically, uh, gaining time it will not lead to a better deal. So it's uh, either an accidental no deal or a bad deal because Brexit. It cannot be good. It cannot be a good uh, project. So it's a failed project. So she failed, but they do have still time to uh, withdraw Article um, 50 and and stop it unilaterally. So basically, they have three options, and uh, it's up to them. Yeah, now. Disagrees, and disagrees we have with to respect the that unilaterally withdrawing it. Uh, they, oh, they can they, do. They, they this is that. There is a decision that All they right. can do that. All right, well, we don't know how that ends and we'll keep watching. Now, there have been a lot of dramatic moments, obviously, from the House of Commons over the last few days. We've seen it all, but all pale in comparison to what you're about to see. For our non-British viewers, this is a big deal. Let's take a look at today's raw moment. We've seen a lot of, uh, of British politics this week. It's certainly steeped in tradition. Can you, can you empathize with the reaction there, the uproar? Well, definitely it is an example that the atmosphere is very tense. It's very nervous. Uh, well, Prime Minister uh, is a fighter. She's trying definitely to buy time. Probably she hopes that in this atmosphere she'll be better able to create some pressure on those hesitant uh, MPs. Uh, but it didn't work out so far. Yeah, indeed. We see a lot of uh, indeed tension, as, as, as you say, you know, a lot of emotion uh, running high there. All right, we would like to thank you for joining us uh, tonight on Raw Politics. Tell us what you were talking about. I'm on Twitter at Tessa or Celia, or you can follow us at Euronews and use the hashtag Raw Politics and tell us what you're thinking. Do have a good evening and bye for now. See you again tomorrow.